Good afternoon, everyone. Move my mask. We hope, hope you had a very good lunch. Yes. <laughs> so before I start, I'd like to congratulate our uh, medical health officers for the very successful rollout um, that they presented a while ago. So for my talk, I will be um, discussing the advances in vaccine and immunization technologies. Okay. So I will be um, talking about the vaccination milestones, the novel vaccine technologies, the new vaccine platforms, adjuvants, and the new vaccine delivery systems. Okay. So let's go back to our history a little bit. So one of the first and greatest milestones in vaccine history is the discovery of cowpox inoculation that can protect humans against smallpox. And this discovery led to the eradication of smallpox. Then as you can see here in the timeline, 80 years later, Louis Pasteur discovered attenuation and worked on anthrax and rabies. Then in the last de decade of the 19th century, the key developments were methods to inactivate the whole bacteria, discovery of bacterial toxins, the production of antitoxins, and the realization that the immune serum contained antibodies. So there, were, there was the wholesale vaccines against typhoid, cholera, and plague. This was produced and then tested. Then came yellow fever, wholesale pertussis, and influenza vaccines. Stanley and Susan Plotkin described the mid-20th century as the golden age of vaccine development because of the growth of viruses in cell culture. And then um, by the 1950s, this was the era for the poliovirus vaccines developed by Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin. The 1960s, measles vaccine. 1970s, varicella, varicella zoster. In 1980s, there were two important strategies for vaccine development the conjugation of your bacterial capsular polysaccharide and genetic engineering. The first vaccine to be developed through genetic engineering was against hepatitis B virus. And now we are in the 2020, and as you well know, we have the mRNA vaccine. And because of these great successes in the vaccine development, we are able to eliminate and reduce the threat of a number of infectious diseases. So this data shows you, um, data from the US, that when they introduced the vaccines, 96 to 100, there was a 96 to 100% reduction in cases of diphtheria, measles, mumps, pertussis, acute poliomyelitis, and also in deaths. So over the years, we have seen a variety of vaccines being developed over a wide variety of pathogens. So I would just like to show you that these are the classical platforms. So we have whole inactivated virus, the live attenuated virus, protein subunit, and also virus-like particles. Now for the newer platforms, we have viral vector, DNA, RNA, and also the antigen-presenting cells. So I think we all know these conventional technologies. We have the live attenuated vaccine, which are prepared from weakened pathogens, and examples of which are your MMR, BCG, cholera, rotavirus, varicella. And then for inactivated, they are derived from killed form of the virulent pathogen. Examples are polio, hepatitis, diphtheria, and tetanus. For virus-like particles, we have HPV, synthetic peptides, we have meningococcal group B, fractional ina inactivated vaccines, diphtheria and tetanus toxoid, and acellular pertussis. For polysaccharide and polysaccharide conjugate vaccines, we have meningococcal, typhoid, pneumococcal, and hemophilus B. So I'd just like to um, maybe mention a little bit about virus-like particles because um, you may also have heard of this because of the COVID-19 vaccine. So these are macromolecular assemblies designed to mimic the morphology of a native virus. It has increased potency due to multivalent interaction, but there are some manufacturing challenges, such as the design in purification and also in storage. It is used in several licensed vaccines, such as hepatitis B and our HPV. 
It is also being developed for chikungunya, Zika, and SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> All right. And then for synthetic peptide vaccines, um, the technology um, uses fragments of protein antigen sequences which are chemically synthesized and assembled into a single molecule. So they are synthetic vaccines, so they don't have the ability to mutate or um, to mutate or cause contamination. And then an example of which is are the FDA approved synthetic peptide vaccines for meningococcal B. This is used in development for several vaccines for infectious diseases like malaria, HCV, influenza, HIV, and cancer. So you will see here in this um, graph that most of the synthetic peptide vaccines are being developed for cancer. So we have always been in the search for um, safer and more effective vaccines even during the pandemic. And the COVID-19 experience really changed the landscape for vaccine development. So as you can see here, this graph shows us the traditional timeline for vaccine development. So approximately, it will take us 10 years to develop a vaccine. But vaccines, it only took us almost one year. So why? Well, the research and development, for example, for mRNA vaccine has been there already for almost 10 years. And then that um, vaccine after sequencing, it only just took several days to make the mRNA vaccine candidates. And also, a lot of the clinical trials during the COVID-19 happened in parallel. So now let's go to the newer platforms. For mRNA vaccines, these vaccines teach our cells how to make protein in order to trigger an immune response. They have several advantages compared to other vaccines, such as shorter manufacturing times. They do not contain a live virus, so there is no risk of causing disease. For viral vector vaccines, they use a modified version of a different virus as a vector to deliver protection. Some examples of viruses that are used as vectors include influenza, vesicular stomatitis virus, measles, and adenovirus. For our COVID-19 vaccine, adenovirus has been used. We also have the DNA vaccines. This consists of plasmid DNA containing the transgene encoding the antigen of interest. The research for DNA vaccines began in 1990s. But there are three major limitations for DNA vaccines. One is the low level of intracellular or intranuclear transport of your plasmid DNA, which can result to low immunogenicity. Then second, the safety issues regarding the possibility of integration of this plasmid into the genomic DNA of the vaccine and activation of oncogenes. And lastly, the potential development of autoimmunity by elicitation of the anti-DNA antibodies. Have you heard of bacterial vector vaccines? Anyone? Okay, so, so this one research is still ongoing. So it uses um, live bacterial cells as carriers. So your carriers are classified into non-pathogenic and attenuated pathogenic bacteria. So yung ano dito is that they have to investigate the risk of infection, especially in children, elderly, and immunocompromised but the genetic engineering allows the attenuation. So I've listed here some examples of bacterial vectors. Examples would be Yersinia pestis, Mycobacterium bovis, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Shigella salmonella, Listeria monocytogenes, and Vibrio cholerae. So I would just like to show you the COVID-19 vaccines that are approved for emergency use authorization here in the Philippines and the platforms that they use so we have mRNA, viral vector, inactivated, and also protein subunit. And these are the candidate vaccines for um, coronavirus. So we have uh, 53 that are in phase one, 
13, phases 1 and 2, phase 2 is 14, phases 2 and 3 is 16, phase 3, 49, and then phase 4, 11. So these are the platforms, protein subun subunit, viral vector, DNA, inactivated virus, RNA, uh, virus-like particle, the antigen presenting cell, the live attenuated virus. So um, as of November 23, there are 175 in clinical development. Okay. So now I will be discussing about adjuvants. So have you heard of adjuvants? Yes. <laughs> okay. So the adjuvants has been um, used safely in vaccines for around 70 years. So these are ingredients used in some vaccines that helps create a stronger immune response. But it can cause more local reactions such as redness, swelling and pain at the injection site, and more systemic reactions such as fever, chills, and body aches than the non-adjuvanted vaccines. So the aluminum salts were initially used in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s with diphtheria and tetanus vaccines. So these are examples of the adjuvants license in the US. We have aluminum. So we can see here that they have been um, used for several vaccines, such as our combination vaccines, uh, Pentacel, our hepatitis A, pneumococcal, as well as our tetanus toxoid. And then we also have AS1, ASO1, which is a monophosphorylip, which um, com the composition of which is from monophosphorylipid A, which is a natural compound extracted from the Chilean soap bark tree contained in a liposomal formulation. So found in zoster vaccine, um, Shingrix, which is the adjuvant for HPV vaccines, Cervarix. And then CPG1018, um, cytosine phosphoguanine, which is a synthetic form of DNA that mimics bacterial and viral genetic material. It is found in hepatitis B. Matrix M, so this one can be found in our Novavax vaccine, COVID-19. And lastly, this, this is 59. And can be found in FluAD or, or our FluAD quadrivalent vaccine. So our next question is, after the adjuvants, the platforms, can we do more? Yes. <laughs> Gusto ko si Dr. J. Lo. <laughs> yes, we can do more. Kasi we've been here. There are a lot of vaccine hesitancy when you were in the field or in the ground. And vaccine compliance is really challenges in increasing our vaccination coverage. So the answer is yes, we can, because we have, key, uh, we have also researches in key de delivery systems for our vaccines. So here we have the nasal and pulmonary immunization, which uses liposomes, polymeric nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles, and also micelles and de dendrimers. So the example of this um, vaccine is the flu mist, this one. This is licensed in the U.S. Okay. Next, we have oral immunization. So I know um, that you also know that we have uh, oral vaccines. Here in the Philippines, we have polio, rotavirus, typhoid, and our cholera vaccines. So yung mga gantong vaccines is one of the most patient-friendly administration route. Okay. So, di ba kung, kung lahat sana ng vaccines natin, oral? <laughs> okay, so for cutaneous um, immunization, here, uh, microneedles, scaffolds, hydrogels, particles. So, imagine for this, ito yung mga dati pa natin naririnig na patch na lang yung vaccine. So, it's made up of uh, microneedles. And then, for the other uh, vaccination technologies, um, they are also developing ways on how we can only have single immunization. So, ang tinitingnan dito are the polymeric nanoparticles, emulsions, and also microfluidics devices. So, I'd just like to show you also that some that are in the clinical trials right now for COVID vaccine, um, has applied for uh, this uh, vaccine delivery system. So we have here to aerosol. So 
nebulize na lang din ang vaccine. Kasi it will use a nebulizer. And then, um, this one is inhalational, and then um, intranasal, and then intradermal. So like our BCG vaccine, oral, and then subcutaneous and IV. So, ang next question natin, what's next? So, we should always be searching for the most effective antigen. We should always ask which genes must be upregulated or downregulated. What antigenic constructions can be used to achieve a protective immune response? How do we develop a good adjuvant formulations? How can the vaccines be painlessly delivered? And also, siyempre, sa country natin, very, ano to, um, kailangan. Thermostable vaccines. And also, we need to develop ways on how, can, how we can have more cost-effective manufacturing as well as be able to deploy in a massive scale. But at, in the end, we need safe and effective vaccines. So I'd like to end my presentation by saying that um, my question din dito, oh, what if it took only 100 days to make a safe and effective vaccine against any virus? So it has already started. Um, yes, being um, initiated by the coalition of um, epi uh, epi Epidemic Preparedness Initiative as well as uh, the UK gov government. They hosted this global pandemic uh, summit exploring how we can respond to the next disease X by making safe, effective vaccines within 100 days. So, ang naging ano nila is to invest 1.5 billion dollars. Okay. okay. So, thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. Thank you, Mamayan, for that very concise lecture.